over and over again, I see artists asking, how do I know where to put the hatching lines in my drawing? Especially, what direction do they put them in? The videos they've watched of hatching being put onto plain balls and cubes hasn't prepared them for the real life scenes that they're wanting to draw. Let me guide you through a number of my drawings with the original reference for many of them and explain not just what my choices were, but why I chose them. By the end of the video, you'll be equipped to make more confident choices yourself about everything to do with hatching. Let's start with a couple of large examples. I want to do a freehand ink line drawing of this Yorkshire country lane, and I'm only going to use line. I'm not using any ink or washes of any sort. So hatching, which is simply drawing lots of lines close together to create a darker effect, or cross hatching, where we lay one or more layers at a different direction across the hatched lines, therefore producing cross hatching is a great way of doing this. But in a drawing, every line counts. We want to get all the value out of every line we can. So we don't only use hatching to create darker areas, but we can also use it to represent local color, where the natural color of one object is lighter than the natural color of another. And we can also use hatching in a way that emphasizes the form of the object that we're looking at. And when we're trying to create a three-dimensional effect on a two-dimensional sheet of paper using lines and marks of a pen, then that's an incredibly helpful thing to be able to do with our hatching. And when we think about hatching lines, it's not just what direction do we put them, though that's a really important thing. It's their length, it's their closeness, it's their thickness, it's the precision or lack of precision that we draw them with. All of these things have an effect on our overall drawing. So let's jump right in and look at my hatching choices for this scene. The most important thing here was to use everything at my disposal to create separation and some sense of order in a scene of mass detail and profusion. So creating values, creating darknesses, area of darkness was really important. And if the area is going to be dark enough, the line direction is less important because we end up with an almost black area. And it's not just our hatching, but it's the interaction of our hatching with the lines we've already drawn in representing our scene as well. If we look at these greenhouses at the side here, we can see the principle I try to use as often as possible, which is hatching lines in a direction that reinforces visually what we know the form, the three-dimensional shape of the object is. So because these are walls that go straight up and down, I like to do vertical lines on my walls. And so these straight lines give a nice contrast to all the lines that aren't straight everywhere else. The pathway gives an indication of using hatch lines, not just to indicate darkness, but to give a sense of form in the way we can see them being rounded. The lines themselves show that there is a curvature on this road, even though they're primarily there to represent the shadow of the bushes being cast. When it comes to foliage, hatching is incredibly important because there is no way we can draw all the leaves that we see. What we have to try and do is really capture the, the values, capture the shadows that go in between the various clumps of foliage or canopies of foliage. And I still try and have a sense of using the form, the outer surface of the tree canopies, as if a cloth had been cling wrapped to it. And I was doing lines to represent the curving directions of that cloth in the shadows. And so there are a lot of lines in my hatching with trees that just curve under. Because often the, the canopy that's in shade is curving under away from us. The other thing is that I bunch my lines together in smaller sections, smaller groupings, which I think reinforces the form of masses of foliage where the foliage tends to be clumped often 
and therefore has shadows between and also changes direction where one clump leads to another. But we can also control our hatching lines to help create a sense of depth. When I draw and want to create a sense of distance, the things that are further away, I draw with a lighter line with less detail and with lighter values. And so this big tree up halfway up the hill is still hatched to represent both the green of the tree and the shade on it, but with a lighter line, lines not as close together so to create a lighter effect. And this combines with some other techniques to give the sense that this is further away from here. A very different example is this drawing of the Royal Chapel at the Palace of Versailles. The original reference I think captures beautifully the elegance of the architecture, this lovely framing of the corresponding curve of the altar in the entrance area, as well as this dome here and a lovely interplay of light and dark. So once the outline is done, how do I suggest the form with my hatching work? And these were my choices. Firstly, along this darker archway under the top, I hatched in the direction of the perspective angles, these angles, because the perspective angles provide a very natural and satisfying sense of the flow of form in our scene and therefore always looks good. With this dome up the top here, I do my hatching lines curving over the top, reflecting the curved surface. But within that, I do lighter and darker areas to very approximately represent the various colors of different lightness and darkness in the mural that is painted there. When it comes to hatching in the actual chapel itself, what I want to do is to put my lines in a direction where they stand out rather than blend into other lines. So if I drawn these lines vertically, in drawing the shadow on the sides of these arches, then they would have blended in both with the lines for the outsides, but also with the vertical lines of the decoration. By doing them horizontally, I create a contrast which helps make clearer that this wall is actually going off at 90 degrees to this wall. And in a drawing where we're going to end up with a lot of lines on the paper, keeping clarity is really important. So often it's a good idea to bring our lines coming in at 90 degrees to the edges where they meet. Now here at the back of the upper gallery, I've used vertical hatch lines for the shadowed area of the back wall. And I want to create a contrast with the line work further down. These ceiling panels here, I've taken those hatching lines in the same direction as the perspective angles. For some reason, I didn't hear. I've gone across, and I think it's a far less satisfactory appearance than over here. Here we have an Australian magpie. Now this subject gives us both local color to think about, the black and the white feathering, but also value in relation to shade and shadow. This side of the bird is in shade, and there's a shadow cast in the grass there. How does hatching help us enhance our drawing of this bird? And I think most importantly, and this was a very quick seven or eight minute sketch, it enables us to indicate something of the curvature of the form of the bird. This rounded, slightly squared barrel shape, which the feathered body has but it also helps us indicate something of the molding of the head as the outer form of the bird becomes more complex. So by taking our lines in the direction of the form, we help create a much stronger sense of roundedness. And of course, if we do our hatching in a different direction, if we just do straight lines in this way, crisscrossing, we can give a very flat, surface appearance to something which is rounded. And I used hatching to also create the shadows in the grass. And again, I'm wanting to emphasize the form of the grass, the, the up and down vertical nature. So my hatch lines correspond to the approximate direction 
of the grass. The next subject is one I couldn't possibly draw without hatching, and that's trees. It's an impossibility to draw all these leaves. So in effect, we're trying to draw the surface of the canopies to capture the effect of where the light strikes them most strongly and where the shade starts to appear, or even where some parts are cast in shadow by other parts. And so once we define the outer edges of our major canopy groups, then we start to use hatch lines for the darkest areas, the darkest values where we will need the most lines in the end. And I like to do them with a sense of curving under because generally speaking in these canopies of masses of leaves, the form does curve under away. And so I want to capture that as well. For the tree trunk, I did my lines horizontally for hatching for two reasons. The first one is it enabled me to get some nice curves in my lines to indicate the form of the tree, that this is a rounded surface. The other reason for doing the lines this way is that there is a fairly strong vertical emphasis in the hatching that I do for the canopy and also for my choice for hatching for the ground. And therefore, it helps the trunk to stand out visually more clearly and just provides more visual interest, I think, to have the lines in a, in a contrasting direction that creates a little bit of lineal tension in the scene. But you'll notice when it came to this shadowed area, while it would have been quicker and easier just to do lots of long horizontal lines, instead, I chose to do far more time consuming, smaller, upright ones because in effect I am drawing the grass that is overshadowed by the tree. If this tree had been surrounded by concrete then drawing flat horizontal lines would have both been faster but also visually more effective at creating what we were seeing. Here we have a morning scene on a rural pathway and the challenge is to draw the detail and to get the values without everything getting lost in a tangle of lines. Firstly, these closer trees, I've used a vertical hatching for, really capturing the canopy basically in silhouette because we're too far away and because of how crowded they are and where our focus is down here, we're not getting a strong sense of three dimensions. And I'm making sure that where possible, I don't run them over the trunks, that I leave them a tiny bit of visual separation. You'll notice for these trees here that are much further away, I've still used hatching and I've done the hatching in a similar way, vertical lines that really are more about simply defining a silhouette shape. But I've used lighter lines and wider spacing and, and less detail to give a sense of further away. Now in contrast, for this shadow of this light pole, I've used horizontal hatching lines. Now it would have been easier just to do a few long, quick ones. And I'd also already worked out that my line work generally for the ground surface here was going to have a horizontal emphasis that was going to provide contrast to the vertical emphasis of the trees. I use heavier hatching in here to separate this far side of the laneway. I use minimal hatching and what I do use is horizontal here. And then when it comes to this shadowed area of grass here, there is actually a rise in the ground level here. There's an embankment that starts to form to get a sense with the hatching for the shadow here of the movement that was happening in the ground. Here is a local waterfall. To create the sense of the water and the lightness of the water, I'm going to have to create the darkness of the rocks, particularly where they're shadowed, using my pen and hatching. And the challenge was whether to do the hatching lines horizontally for these shadowed areas or vertically. Now the water is obviously falling vertically. So if I'd put the lines horizontally, that would have been a nice contrast. And yet these layers of rock go horizontally and they may have all just got mixed up too much in the line work in the horizontal hatching work and not being as clear with their wonderful step, step, step down form. I chose the vertical lines in the end 
and did my best to make the areas dark enough so that the water still looked like it was water coming down. I also worked hard to do extra hatching in some parts to create extra darkness, extra contrast. If we look here, I've got cross hatching in several layers. We have lines that come pretty much straight down the whole way, but then we have some under here that curve in this direction. We have some that curve out this way, which also creates a lighter section here. And then we had some extra ones that were just placed in the lighter section here as well. Over on this side, we've got some darker areas here where the rock is curving under, away from the light more. We can use our hatching to show the form of those rocks in a way that would have been otherwise lost. Now, a very different subject is this pine cone. And again, it offered a number of choices for line direction. I drew the outline of the pine cone first. Now, for these sections, following the roundness of these protruding seed bearers was an obvious enough choice. The other side, this flat side, I wasn't sure at first whether to do the hatching lines in a lengthways direction. I thought that in some ways could have been a nice contrast and it could have been leading down into the center, which was going with the direction of the form. But in the end, I decided that that would possibly become too confusing with just the actual outlines of these forms. And I was better off keeping them horizontal again this tumble of rocks is just a good example of seeing the agility that hatching can give us to represent form really very quickly if we want. When we have a rock, again, where the rock is broken off, and we can easily represent different curvature of the rock by changing the direction of our hatching to follow the form that we see. This was a five minute, very quick sketch I did. And because it was five minutes, I didn't have time to consider anything for the hatching except very quick, rough, gestural, vertical lines to fill the space as quickly as possible. But really, it had the effect of obscuring whatever architectural detailing on the front I'd had the chance to draw before I added that. I could see that this first earlier hatching was a better direction, but I just didn't have time to do it. I was very curious about how it would look if I drew it differently. So I came back and redrew this for another video. And this is the effect between the two drawings of doing the hatching vertically and doing it horizontally. A far happier choice, I think, at creating greater definition of the three-dimensional form that is actually this facade of the Abbey. I think it more happily matched the horizontal bands of stone that were laid in the construction. So the choices that we make in terms of line direction can make a big difference to how our drawing looks in the end. We shouldn't be afraid of hatching and cross hatching. It's a wonderful drawing device technique for creating incredible effects. Using short lines, we can create the sense of trees, of canopies, of ground, of grass, of rock faces, of weathered rounded rocks in the surf and of distant headlands or headlands more distant still. I hope this has given some sense of how we can use our hatching lines and encourages you to just have a go. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. So whatever the next thing you hatch is, I hope this has been helpful for it, but also that you have a lot of fun experimenting with the different effects hatching can create. I'll see you next time. Bye.